Hi guys, welcome back to Rue Morgue TV. Be sure to stick around to the end of the episode because I have a contest for all you horror soundtrack movie nerds out there. I know you're out there and you're going to want to hear what I have to say, so stay tuned. Hey everybody, between the time we recorded uh, the segment you're about to watch, uh, my dear friend Andrew Bales, better known as the Gourmet, uh, passed away very suddenly. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about him before we did this because Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, meant a lot to both of us. Andrew and I uh, were both participants in the 90s and early 2000s on a Usenet uh, board called Alt.Horror. Uh, and he, we just used to go on and talk shit and talk about horror movies. He wanted to see the what was then the new remastered version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was, and this is really going to date me, uh, I owned on Laserdisc. Sometime after that, I was interested in watching Italian cannibal movies, and I didn't know where to start. So I sent him an email because I knew he knew a lot about these and said, hey, where do I even start with this subgenre of, of incredible violent weirdness? And instead of responding with an email, he sent me a three-page essay about the history of Italian cannibal cinema. And it was just, it was amazing. It was an incredible read. And so one of the next things I did was introduce him to Rodrigo Godino, the uh, editor of Remorque. And they hit it off. And the next thing I knew, Andrew, the gourmet, was part of the Remorque OG crew. Uh, I'm intensely proud that I was able to make that happen. I was intensely proud of Andrew for everything that he did and brought to the magazine. Um, to you guys, he was the gourmet. To me, he was Andrew, and he was my friend. And I miss him terribly. Buddy, this one's for you. Welcome back to Rumor TV. My name's Joe O'Brien, and on today's Anatomy of a Scream, we're going to talk about the three scariest words in the English language. Massacre, chainsaw, and especially Texas. <laughs> Everything is horrible all the time. The end. That's the plot of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And yet, it's still one of the greatest movies ever made. I don't think that there's any argument that it is still the ultimate horror movie. It's a thick slice of southern gothic barbecue nightmare fuel. It's yet to be equaled. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is an exploration of evil. And it looks at evil in very different ways. For, for having such a simple plot, it... Uh, it examines evil in different facets using its three primary villains. Uh, the first person we meet is uh, uh, Ed Neal as the hitchhiker, who is this kind of post-Charles Manson, uh, obviously manic, clearly crazy, always on the edge of violence kind of evil, this very frontal evil that we get. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> the second kind of evil that they explore, and this is, to my mind, is actually kind of one of the most interesting things about Texas Chainsaw, it doesn't get talked about a lot, is um, uh, Jim Seedow as the cook. And this is, he very much embodies the banality of evil. He's so banal that we don't even recognize him as a villain in the first half of the movie. It's only much later that we realize just how horrifying he is. <laughs> There's no need to do that. <laughs> Nobody's going to hurt you. <laughs> no! <laughs> and then we get to Leatherface, who comes along almost halfway through the film. We don't see him. We don't refer to him. There's nothing. He comes out of nowhere. Leatherface is this kind of ancient evil. It's like a, an atavistic, primitive evil. He's not even, he doesn't even seem human. It feels like music. The, the movie moves through these three movements where we first meet the hitchhiker, and then we meet the cook, and then we meet Leatherface. And it's only in the last third of the movie that we realize all three of these characters that who we've met randomly throughout the film are not only connected, they're related. They're members of the Sawyer family, a cannibalistic clan that's just hanging out in Texas and making the best of a bad economy after uh, the slaughterhouse went under. 
yes, when the cows aren't around, you move on to the next best thing, which is people. Hey, Grandpa, we're going to let you have an export. <laughs> Nothing good happens in this movie. There's nothing good. It's just a series of bad things on a spectrum from bad to worse. It has virtually no plot. I mean, what's the plot of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? It can be summed up in its tagline, who will survive and what will be left of them? The answer is almost no one and very little. There's no resolution to anything. There's no subplot, there's no nothing. It's just this grueling experience presented to us by a bunch of people who had the grueling experience of making this movie in one of the hottest summers in Texas history. There isn't a laugh in this movie. There isn't a, a, a soft moment. Actually, no, I'm sorry. There is one laugh in this movie. But you have to know the story, and you have to know exactly where to look. Fortunately, we here at Rumor TV are willing to provide that service for you. In the scene where uh, actor Alan Danziger goes into the uh, meat hook room, he's the third person killed. This is after the scene we're going to talk about today. I want you to watch very carefully for it. Um, Alan Danziger, the actor, had direction was to go into the room, open up the freezer, uh, at which point actress Terry McMinn would sort of jump out. Fine, that's all fine. And then he turns around just as Gunnar Hansen as Leatherface comes walking in. Here's the thing. Alan Danziger had never seen Gunnar Hansen in costume before. So when he turns around and sees Leatherface lurching at him, the shriek of terror that he gives out and the look on his face is 100% real. It's incredible. It is 100% the image of a man shitting his own pants. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in a movie. Today I want to talk about an amazing scene in the film. It's Leatherface's introduction. It's the first two kills in the movie, but that's not the most important thing. It narratively is the moment the film transforms itself from one thing to another, and it actually happens in one single shot, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, okay, so here we are. It's uh, Pam and Kirk arriving at what we will later learn is the Sawyer House. Let's go. Shot very innocuously at first and very deliberately innocuously uh, for oh. reasons that are about to become clear. Uh, here's Kirk doing the classic horror movie thing of, uh, I'll just go into this strange weird house and ask if anybody's around. Uh, check out the way this red pops out of the frame, though. This is a great production design work by Bob Burns, uh, which we're about to see a lot more of pretty soon. This little uh, three-step cut, uh, Hooper does this a lot in this movie. Uh, he, I think, got it from Hitchcock, who used it pretty effectively in The Birds, and he used to use it to uh, uh, emphasize Hello. fairly grisly things. He uses it in The Birds to uh, zoom in on a... And here comes Leatherface. <laughs> Imagine being in a theater and seeing that for the first time with no context. That is horrifying. But maybe not as horrifying as this horrible, horrible response. No quick kills in this movie. Death does not come easy to anyone. And then that amazing door slam and that huge bassy sound. Great piece of sound design. Uh, here's the shot I'm talking about. The, shot, the house is shot very innocuously before, but now check this out. Uh, Daniel Pearl, the cinematographer, keeps uh, actress Terry McMahon the same size in the frame as they dolly towards the house, and it just looms up over her like a monster that's about to devour her, uh, which is, turns out is not too far from the truth, as is literally what's about to happen. The cinematography in this movie was uh, often criticized when it first came out on video because there were a lot of bad transfers, but fortunately the remastering really uh, brings it all to life. Uh, Daniel Pearl... Uh, being an excellent cinematographer. This is actually the shot that kind of made his career and he uh, has gone on to become quite a big deal uh, and even wound up shooting the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake in the early 2000s, which is a lovely shot movie but very, very different uh, in tone than this one. So here's Terry literally going into the belly of the beast. Uh, we're about to get a really good look at uh, some brilliant Bob Burns production design as she falls into this room. And this is one of the great things about Texas Chainsaw is it contrasts beauty and horror at the same time, but he doesn't use beauty to mollify the horror. It actually emphasizes it greatly. He gives an aesthetic to incredibly grisly things here, which we're going to see. So this both feels like some strange museum, but also it feels like the belly of a beast. It's literally these are like the remains of things that have been digested. Uh, and this is an idea, that is just the weirdest image, this chicken trapped in a, trapped in a bird cage. I don't know what concept there is, but I guess keep your chicken safe, folks. Um, 
we're going to see a lot of this. This is Hooper really makes a meal out of this scene. It's like how many more grisly artifacts can we just linger over? Uh, if you watch really carefully towards the end of this sequence, you're going to see uh, a rather funny joke. Uh, this is a great piece of sculpture. I love this. There is an armchair just behind her, which you'll see as she exits the room, that has actual arms on it. They never spend a lot of time pointing it out because it might even be too cheesy a gag, but it's pretty funny. Uh, so I was wrong. There are actually two funny jokes in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She is about to, of course, have her first encounter with Leatherface. Watch Gunnar Hansen's body language here. Other actors who have played this part kind of play Leatherface like Jason or something. They're very sort of predatory, unstoppable human truck. But Gunnar Hansen's got a different thing going on. He really sort of humanizes the character. Leatherface isn't predatory in this movie. Leatherface is actually having a really bad day. People keep breaking into his house, and he keeps having to deal with him. And he sounds flustered and shocked and surprised. And when he sees Pam, as you'll see in a moment, he's shocked to find her there. He's scared and surprised, and he's just reacting. There it is. <laughs> okay, watch Gunnar Hansen here. He's like, what? Oh, shit, now what? Uh, this moment is actually quite heartbreaking because she almost makes it, and he just drags her back in, literally kicking and screaming. The strongest aspects of Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, is this idea of dehumanization. Leatherface, oh, here comes the meat hook. Leatherface looks at people not as sentient creatures, they're just meat to be dealt with. He hangs her up here. This is a great moment. Uh, Terry Min is hanging on essentially a parachute harness. And I love the matter of fact way that they hang her up here. Uh, this meat hook scene is brutal. There's no, you never see any shots of penetration. There's the chainsaw. Uh, nor did they go to the more obvious route of adding some kind of over the top sound effect. It's just a very matter of fact thing because it's a matter of fact thing to other things. Now we think, even here, he might be taking the chainsaw to her, but he's not. He's just getting on with his earlier work of being a porker. And this is one of those things where it's the, the whole thing is just dealt with an almost documentary style. Leatherface isn't concerned about Pam right now. He's going to deal with her later. This is just getting on with dealing with the meat. And we end on this lovely symbolic shot of fan blades slicing through the light. That's a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, and there you have it. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out in 1974, and it remains just as horrifying, terrifying, and potent today as it did when it came out. It, it draws from the same uh, horrifying real-life well as Psycho, and it projects forward to Silence of the Lambs, while at the same time setting up every slasher cliche in the world. It's the granddaddy of the slasher movie, but it's so much more than that. And today I kind of want to talk about it as not just a horror film, it might be the epitome of the American film period. It might be the ultimate American movie. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is about America and America is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's it for me today. I'm Joe O'Brien. This is Anatomy of a Scream and you're watching Room Org TV. Don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. You, it's YouTube, you know what to do. Uh, and stay scared. Hi guys, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode and I'm glad you stuck around because have I got a contest for you. If you subscribe to Room Org Magazine right now, you can be entered to win a free copy of Blood on Black Wax Horror Movie Soundtracks on Vinyl. It's a beautiful hardcover book that all you soundtrack lovers are going to dig and you get a subscription to Room Org Magazine. It's really win-win. So the details are below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. Thank you for your concern for my hydration, you fuckers. Don't use that, Kevin. What? What did I just say? What?